So in case you're wondering, I had a wonderful trip to Toronto, and uh, um, everything is ready for the Pope to visit Canada now. So I got, got everything in order for him, so it should be good. Um, and I can attest, first-hand witness, that uh, Greg Schweitz is now the president of Sarah International. Now, some of you uh, might not be aware, uh, Sarah is not spelled with an I, okay? It's not Sierra Club, okay? It's Sarah, named after Unipro Sarah, now Saint Unipro Sarah, the one who, uh, Franciscan who went through uh, California back in the 1750s, yeah, and, and settled, you know, and created all of these um, uh, missions. Um, some of those missions have grown a little bit, um, like San Francisco, for example, and San Jose, and you know places like that. They've grown just a little bit since he was there. But uh, um, the the Sarah International, it's all about Sarah uh, Club, is all about promoting vocations to priesthood and consecrated life, and so. I'm really, really grateful for all the work that Greg has already done and Mary Lynn, but in what they uh, intend and, and plan to do uh, throughout this next year of his reign supreme. So um, one, of the, one of the great blessings that came with this, unexpected blessing for me, was meeting yet another prelate or uh, hierarchy of the church in Canada. Um, I had been to Canada one other time, uh, for a Kateri conference, uh, the, uh, the National uh, Kateri Tekakwitha Conference. And I met two bishops there at that time uh, who were really impressive. And what I learned about their uh, history before they became bishops was that both of them had served on what they call in in Canada, reserves. We call them reservations here, but uh, those, those uh, places where are set aside for First Nations people or the indigenous people of Canada. And uh, one of them had served so long that he spoke the language of the Cree people fluently. And I was just amazed by these two bishops that I met because uh, in the United States, you know, the, the pedigree, if you will, or the, the history of the service of a priest before they're elevated to be a bishop is really different from that, at least before Francis it was. It was mostly, oh, in seminary formation or chancery office work and things like that. But what I found, and so one of the new prelates I met, the, the Cardinal Archbishop of Quebec, um, I have a hard time pronouncing his name because I'm used to calling it Lacroix, uh, from the, the can of water, right? Uh, it's spelled the same, but they, they say it so much more eloquently there. Um, Lacroix, or something like that. Uh, I can't, I, I, I just don't do well with French. but. He had spent nine years in, in the missions in Colombia, uh, South America. And he spoke Spanish fluently, spoke English fluently, spoke French fluently. He came from a town of a hundred people. His dad was a lumberjack and a farmer. And now he is the, the highest, basically highest ranking uh, uh, Catholic hierarchy in all of Canada. Actually, we all go back in our history to the Diocese of Quebec. It was the first diocese in this hemisphere, okay? So all of North and Central and South America, we've all kind of come from that diocese, okay? Um, and so I was still yet again amazed at... Uh, the process that the Canadian church has long used in, in raising up pastors or shepherds for the people there. 
And um, that's why I, I turned to their example. Uh, many years ago, they wrote a document uh, encouraging uh, praying for healing and reconciliation among the First Nations people. Uh, that, of course, is why the Pope is going there, if you've uh, seen the news. He's going to further that work of healing and reconciliation because of the, the mistakes that were made, the, the, um, the, the abuses that, that happened on those uh, mission schools on the reserves. Um, and, but with a, a person like Cardinal Archbishop LaCroix leading the way, I can only imagine that that, that, that healing and reconciliation will definitely be furthered if the other side of the equation is open to it, because he's a very, very gentle and gracious, holy man. One of the things that leads to that uh, is prayer. And that's what we have in our gospel this morning. We have this, uh, the disciples longing for Jesus to teach them how to pray. And so he gives us, uh, Luke's version anyway, uh, is, is the, the, uh, the skeletal version of what we have come to know as the Our Father, of course, right? Uh, a couple of things about that. When we uh, think about growing in our own prayer life, we have to recognize first and foremost that it's, it's about a relationship, right? It's not a business transaction. Okay, just think about that. We don't say prayers to manipulate God into our, our hopes and dreams, right? And our way of thinking. That's not why we pray. Now, I still slip into that, okay, from time to time. I still slip into thinking, it's like, oh, okay, maybe if I just pray a little bit longer, God will grant me my wish, you know? It doesn't work that way. God always answers our prayers, but sometimes not in the way that we are hoping, right? Because especially if our prayer is self-serving, that's typically never going to be the answer that God will give us because God knows what we need better than we do. So it starts out, he taught his disciples to start out by, by recognizing that uh, we have the translation Father in English, but Abba, it would be much more appropriate if it, if it said Daddy, right? You've all heard this before. It's a much more intimate word than a, an official sounding. An intimate word because it's called to be an intimate relationship. That's God's desire more than anything else is that we grow in intimacy in that relationship. So that when uh, we need God most in our lives, that relationship will be there to cradle us, to hold us, to support us. And when we have times of great joy, he will be there to rejoice with us as well. So it's that relationship. And the other thing I think that is very obvious in our readings today, including the first reading, which was proclaimed beautifully, Jean, thank you very much for that. That, <laughs> yeah, I told her in the sacristy, it's like, ooh, Patrick Murray did a wonderful job last night, a masterful job with that first reading. No pressure. <laughs> You did wonderfully. But that reading, that, that story about Abraham, you know, just, just coming back one more time, one more time, one more time, one more time. That persistence is, is the key, I think, to, to what we hear in our first reading and later on in the gospel. We are called to be persistent in that relationship. If we don't sense anything in our prayer, stay with it. Don't get discouraged and go, ugh. I mean, perfect, perfect example for us to look at is Mother Teresa, right? We hear after she died that she had 
years of dryness, of not really feeling God's response to her prayer, but she stayed persistent with it anyway. So let us, let us recognize that this relationship is calling us into the deep, calling us into that deeper intimacy with the Lord. And let us be persistent with us in recognizing that, that it's, it's not about what we want. It's thy will be done. That is the, uh, the basis of which we are, are instructed in our gospel today.